uh, I know it's all original, 276-18 is the serial number. So I'm not sh exactly sure, does that make it about 36? Yeah, yeah, 217, yeah. 276-18. Yeah. Uh, it was originally bought new by a man named Henry Williams in Greensboro, North Carolina. He, the day he bought it at the music store there in Greensboro, he took uh, his bandmates into the photo studio and had pictures made. And wow. I have those pictures. And you can see the unusual purfling in the picture. It's never, a, never seen this before yeah. on, a, on any instrument, especially a Gibson. Yeah. So this, this must have been uh, some samples that they must have sent them or something, you know, they're, they're uh, jobbers for their yeah. marketry and stuff. Right. I've yeah. never, never seen this before. Yeah. And the, 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 uh, the truss rod cover and the case is embossed. Well, the truss rod cover has his initials. The case has his name. And I'm given to think that it was a custom order. It, it sure is. Uh, yeah, it's 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 pretty standard for a style four mahogany neck, chrome plated parts, uh, forty hole tone ring, one piece flange. But but this this is is something like I said, something I've never seen before. Yeah. But it's totally original. Oh yeah. Oh, you just touched on a, a factor that a lot of people don't realize is they er, the standard belief is that style four is chrome and walnut, but I've never seen a pre-war Gibson style four banjo with a walnut neck. Have you? Yeah. The only one I've ever seen was mahogany stained to look like walnut. Well, this, this wood is very deceiving. Um, believe it or not, that is walnut. No. Really? Yes, it is. Yeah, and I'll show you why. You see these grains yeah. right here? Yeah. How far apart they are? Mm -hmm. Mahogany, well, that, mahogany yeah, doesn't do yeah. that. Well, you're right. That is but a wall. Doesn't that neck look like mahogany? Well, that's that's what happens with these uh, 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 walnut original necks. Gibson put very little stain, and even more sparse lacquer yeah. on their necks. So after playing these instruments for a few months, you actually started wearing through. The original finish, and and so that's that's why this appears to be uh, mahogany. This is just straight grain French walnut. Huh? That's what that yeah. is. But as after a few months of playing, you'd you'd actually wear through the uh, the first coat yeah. or coats yeah. of lacquer right down into the stain, and and even <coughs> quicker wear through the stain, and you'd yeah. be right on bare wood. Yeah. And but that. That, that is, believe it or not, that is a wall. Well, that's why I asked him to come by. And I, told you, <laughs> I told you he'd tell us something about it. I didn't know. Well, if you, if you look at those yeah. grains up there yeah. between those two tuners, now doesn't that look like walnut? It does, yeah. It does, but this doesn't look like this walnut. This doesn't look all. like walnut, yeah. but the Gibson used a uh, specific species of walnut that, to, that come from France. Because it'd be stronger for a neck, right? Or cheaper. <laughs> 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 More likely yeah. cheaper, yeah. and I yeah. and I learned that uh, I didn't just come up with that. I, I learned that from uh, uh, one of the gurus of the Gibson products uh, and the banjos in particular, uh, Curtis McPeak. Yeah, yeah. From years of association with him, he said that all the all the wood that they uh, used, or typically all of it, uh, for style fours right. was French walnut. Yeah. Right. It's not American walnut. I know. I saw a black walnut. Fake it's not yesterday, black walnut, and uh, it was so clearly a fake. This is yeah. this. I don't even know if you can get get this uh, yeah. species of walnut today. And that question was was just as active 30 years ago. Yeah. Nobody yeah. knew where to get French walnut. Right. And the resonator. Resonator. Well, of course, the resonator is made up of of uh, five plies of wood sandwiched together. And so this is, is actually nothing but an outer veneer, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, as is uh, the sidewall. Um, I don't know. I don't know if this would be uh, French walnut remnants, or you know, get a package deal, order 100 pounds of walnut, and get 
50 veneer sheets. I don't know. I don't know how they did it back then, right. but I can assure you that Gibson done the cheapest, <laughs> the best deal that they could find. That's yeah. not to say that their products were cheap, right? But and it's also 36, in the height of the depression. Yeah. Yeah. And and this yeah. this neck could have been left over. This banjo is very much like Butch Robbins. Yeah, I know. Banjo, yeah. except his is a yeah, original it's a flathead, flathead. But yeah. the neck feels right. the same. Yeah. Uh, but it's anyway, very that's, close in number. That's yeah. about all I could could enlighten yeah. you about is is that that's a that's a species mm. of French yeah. French walnut. Well, one unique thing about this banjo is that it has never been touched. No, it's it's it's, it's unmolested. Case and everything. I bought it in 1971. And I've had it since then. So Henry Williams had it from '36 to '71, and I've had it since then. But is it called the Tony Williamson banjo? <laughs> no, it's still the Henry Williams banjo. <laughs> right. I can tell you something about this head too. This is a first issue plastic Remo head. Yep. That, that yep. hit the market in 1959. Right. This is what Crow and Scruggs and those guys put on their banjos yep. and never when they back. decided. No more skins, <laughs> and it's uh, designated by that Weather yeah. King stamp. The next version had a big, right, a big crown that yeah. was about that big that you couldn't miss, you yeah. couldn't hide it. Yeah, under even under the yeah. tailpiece it hangs out. Yeah. But this this is actually a first issue, yeah, uh, Remo yeah. plastic head. Yeah, awesome. Which is cool to have on this yeah. banjo, yeah, or any banjo. Yeah, yeah. Well, how about favoring us with a tune? Well, I thought we just did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll try something. How you guys doing this morning? Good, good, good say, girl. say howdy. <laughs> It's got something on it that uh, that shows up on a lot of these original five strings. It's got mandolin frets in it. See how tiny these frets yeah. are? You, you can't hardly make a clear note on it because they're so tiny. That's why he likes it. That's why, he's, that's why it's his banjo. <laughs> well, I think it's remarkable 
that this man can walk in here, mm. pick up some picks he's never seen before, pick up a banjo he's never yeah, seen before, it sounds like it too. and give us this kind of life. <laughs> 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 give us this kind of life. He's here much too kind. But, but yeah, that's, uh, these, these frets showed up uh, a lot in banjos. Uh, there was a lot of quality control at Gibson, but not to the nth degree, always. And that's why you let, let me trade you out of that unused tell set. Us, tell me a story. <laughs> I, was, I was telling uh, Carla, my wife, and uh, we had breakfast with Jerry this morning, and I told Jerry that story about you getting those spreads. <laughs> so I had a, uh, a nice uh, fern lure, and it was all original, except the first seven frets were worn out. And you know, a lot of, a lot of times nowadays, even this one, I've had you know, small frets, but they're stainless steel uh, put in. But it was so perfect, I wanted it to continue to have original frets. So I call up Charlie, and we kind of go through back and forth a little bit. And he had, yeah, you had a mandolin banjo. That's right. That, and, and I was like thinking, well, you know, mandolin banjo, that, you know, combines the most obnoxious qualities of both the man and the <laughs> And so the best thing he could possibly do is take the neck off of that thing and give it to me. Right. And then I'd rob the frets. Because the other thing about mandolin banjos is you can always count on the frets being unused because nobody ever plays them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they sound so bad nobody will play one. You know, they're, they're horrible. So, so I call up Charlie and we kind of uh, make a little trade. And I'm thinking he's going to pull the frets out of this mandolin banjo. Instead, when I go to the post office, I pull out this little package he sends me, and he sent me a whole packet of completely unused 1926, still had the writing from the original owner who had bought a spare set of frets for That's his right. banjo. That's exactly and right. And they were uh, .55, I believe, which is right in the ballpark of Lloyd Lore frets. And I was like, man, what well, a guy. <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I bought the band, the mandolin banjo, it was a, it was a lot like this. It was a one-piece flange, uh, style, style one pot, and a, and a MB11 neck with the leather toilet seat stuff on it. Uh, I got the, the banjo with the skin head, the original case, the little rope strap that the guy bought for it. Yeah. But when this guy bought this instrument, he was looking way ahead. And he contacted Gibson, and he had Gibson send him another set of frets because he was planning on wearing this thing out, I, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that never happened. Yeah. So, so in the case, when I bought the instrument from Gruen, there was a little white envelope that said, said uh, uh, original factory frets, Gibson, Kalamazoo, Michigan on it, wrapped up in a little paper envelope that was 80 years old. And I've, I've had this for 20 years. Yeah. And so he called and he said, I need some frets. So I got your frets right yeah. here. <laughs> so that's that's how we do things. Yeah. You know? yeah. That's, yeah. We give and we share. And, and those frets are now in a 1924 Lloyd Lord. Where they should be. All original. Yeah, yeah, instead of an empty mandolin banjo case. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you got it. I appreciate that yeah, so man. much. And that was a surprise going through the post office. You've even got extras now, yeah. don't you? Oh, yeah, because yeah. you, yeah. you can do another mandolin yeah. if you need to. I'm sure glad you're not a nut about these old frets like I am. No, you're more of a nut than I am. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to those, you know, the, the mandolins. Yeah. But those were your frets all along. We just yeah. didn't know it. <laughs> now, this next fella over here that I'm going to introduce to you is also a nut. <laughs> <laughs> and he knows, even though you see him playing banjo with Lord Lewis and mandolin with a lot of different bands, uh, he knows these instruments as good as anyone, and boy, he can really kick it too. Please make welcome Patrick Salt. <laughs> so, tell us about that guitar. I don't know. Is it for sale? <laughs> <laughs> well, what number is it? It's not mine. I can tell you that. Unfortunately, I wish it were. So that's a 37D18. 37D18. Wow. Pins have been replaced, <laughs> obviously. And obviously there's some additions. Those are fun. I like stuff like that. Yeah. That's some old 
gorgeous shell flask. I love it. Yeah. You let me know when you want to get rid of this. Okay. He, he, this is also a situation where he'd never seen this guitar before. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he's just, I'm okay with it though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll survive. <laughs> but. Uh, you know, the D18 is sort of the workhorse of bluegrass that so many, uh, so many players have used those over the years. And they really do cut a microphone great. How about picking out a tune and demonstrating that thing a little bit? Hmm. We could do something like, might be odd in C, but maybe Beaumont Rag? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Julius Finkbein's Rag. <laughs> This is an old 37K uh, concert bass, nothing special as far as uh, uh, the bass. Uh, I love the tone of it, and uh, it's one of the first ones made. They started making K's in 1937. This is number 804, I believe, and that's with a few cellos thrown in the number sequence, but uh, I just like it. I'm on a lot of basses, but I always go back to this one. Just a good tone in the old K. So the first ones they say had a thinner top, maybe three plies as opposed to four plies later. And so they're a little more resonant, perhaps. And I think they went to a thicker top because with no heating and air conditioning, typically back then they were caving in. That's 
sort of thing with temperature and humidity changes. So uh, anyway, I uh, like the old days. And, uh, of course, a lot of people will play the American standards uh, with a bit bigger body, but they're, they're great also, just a, a bigger sound sometimes. But, uh, uh, like I say, it's just a matter of what you get used to, I think, sometimes. And Show them the wood in that base. Ron, talk a little bit about the the yeah, they, they, the sides wood. and back are typically maple, and the top is spruce. Of course, they're laminate, just uh, different layers. But the the back stays. Yeah, they they you don't see co-bases flamed down a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, yeah they they a bunch of banjos there, wouldn't you? <laughs> 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 Saw it up and make banjos out of it. Yeah. yeah. A lot of resonators in that yeah, back. Yeah, they're not as down there. Yeah. <laughs> I've had this one probably uh, 15 years, maybe, close to it. We should take his base apart. came out of high school in Michigan. It's got names carved in it. And, uh, has South High uh, scraped into the tumors and uh, the old 420 sign on the back of the headstock here for the pot smokers. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that coming. <laughs> Did uh, Kay buy out the American Standard at some time? Did they buy the I don't know. Shut uh, them down or just buy them? I heard they bought the molds. And yeah, I, I don't think. So. I don't think so. The, the, the dimensions never changed on the on the case. Uh, the What's the last year American Standards? I don't know. I, it would be early '60s, I believe. Okay. Uh, they started making in about '36, '37. They were made in Cleveland. Along with the King Base, they were both made by the H.N. White Company in Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, of course the K's were made in Chicago. And Englehart bought K in maybe October of '69, something like that. So one issue I run into, and maybe it's because these bases are the workhorse of bluegrass for sure, um, but I've run into a lot of these bases from the 30s, the K's from the 30s and 40s, and had delamination problems. Yeah. Is that more a product of the playing them outdoors in the rain, or is there something happening at this particular age to some of these old bases? I think a lot of that is from people not using base stands and just dragging them around. And, uh, with different plies of, of laminate, it's easier for the outer layers to chip off. And, yeah. It's an easy fix, of course, you just glue in some thin laminate and stain it in, but um, it's a very common problem. Yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. Well, would you like to call a tune that features the bass a little bit? Uh, not in particular. I don't have anything. We uh, <laughs> may, have, may have noticed we didn't rehearse. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which may be a good thing. Since oh, you thank want, you. Uh, yeah, man. Thank you. Okay. No, just, I'll just play along with whatever you uh, okay. choose to play. Yeah. All right. Grandfather's fine. Bass solos aren't, aren't the most popular <laughs> thing in the world. Yeah. You guys pick us one. Well, let's see. Crazy Creek. Crazy Creek? I like Crazy Creek. <laughs> you might want to get into a flat here. I don't think so. No. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't. I don't know oh, that. I don't that song. I okay. That too, but I don't know the banjo. Okay. All right. All right. That's out. Well, All right. I'm gonna play something a little more sedate. Yeah. You don't mind? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Waltz. Scott. Okay, so Waltz. Never listen to Scotty. Yeah. <laughs> That's more my speed today. I'll play whatever you want. No, no, no. Play Waltz. <laughs> so, so I was, it. I was thinking, uh, Foggy Mountain Special. Yeah, that's good. Okay. And we'll get a little bass going on that. Okay. Yeah. Why not? And I'll, I'll take Curly Sacred's Lambert break. How about that? <laughs> All right. Okay. okay.
Something happened at Gibson uh, between 23 and 24, and one wonders how much of it was a, something that they considered and did intentionally. And, and I, I kind of think it was intentional because uh, the color got darker and the sound got darker. It, it's uh, a funny thing to me. It seems to me like whenever you see a dark mandolin, it has a darker tone. The one I was just playing was had that bright projection, you know, the, which I kind of associate with Bill Monroe, David Grisman, and this has the darker, it's also February 18th of 24, which is associated with uh, uh, John Reichman, Chris Steely, Mike Marshall, John Paul Jones, uh, and it has that. I mean, it's still got plenty of projection, plenty of high end and everything. What things do you think they did to actually make it sound darker? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> now, a lot of them had Versi tone producers in it, and this one originally did have a Versi tone producer, but it was sort of the practice, especially back in the 70s, that if you found one with a Versi tone producer, you would take it out. <laughs> and there's a, uh, I think you can actually get it on the internet, a recording of uh, when Todd Phillips took Mike Marshall's Versi out. It was quite a thing. And, <laughs> I, I was out in California at the time. Some of the verses are just glued in, but some of them have a little brad that stick up into the top of the mantle. And you don't really know which one you got. So Todd was, he had a little thing going, he was trying to do it from here, and he hit that thing and it's, <laughs> well, you have to hear the tape, it sounds like the whole uh, yeah. roof was falling in. <laughs> but this one had it taken out a little more gently and uh, I, think, I think they did a really good job with it. Let me see if I can try to play something on this thing and, and demonstrate what a, what a darker sound would be. See, what would be a good one? Uh, Y'all up for a bluegrass breakdown? Yeah, man. Here we go. Thank you. Yeah. All right, here we go. And then we'll play waltzes from here on out. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Isn't that strange? Isn't that, <laughs> Isn't that just strange? That's really amazing. Well, have you heard the outtake? You, of course you have. They, they've got oh, the yeah. outtakes of that. Yeah. It started out a very different arrangement. Yeah. Uh, it was... But it was always a mandolin. It was always a mandolin piece. But Earl wrote it. But, uh, well... <laughs> Isn't that strange? When, <laughs> when you're a bluegrass boy, you work for me. <laughs> no, when you work for another guy, you could take him a tune and say, look, I got an idea for a tune. Back in those days, if, if it was your idea and you was working for him, it became his property. If you wanted it recorded, if he thought it was good enough, that could have happened. You know, Bill Monroe, you know, he didn't, he didn't invent everything. You know, he, he, Bill Monroe, I will say, what I knew of him, he was a very lucky man. In the fact, he would leave town sometime under contract with no band, somewhere between point A and the show point, pick up a band, or have guys waiting on him there that just wanted to play with him. Yeah, always, and he always, always. he always made the day. Yeah, always. But, but Bill Monroe is just like any other band leader. You, if you have good musicians around you, you can use their ideas. Who knows? No, nope. nobody knows if that's true, except Earl and Bill, and, they're, and and it'll never be solved. And you can think about it all you want to if you want to waste your time doing that. <laughs> but nobody will ever know. Just because Earl Scruggs said it, you know, over at our house, that doesn't mean everything. <laughs> it just don't. It just don't. why didn't he say it? When Monroe was living. Why did? Yeah. Why didn't they sit down and talk about it? That's my well, would be good, my curiosity. That's a good question, but boy, that's that's a rare thing, really. But Monroe turned it into a banjo piece later on. Yep. You see, so you can look at it any way you want to, <laughs> <laughs> and even if you figure it out, you know what? It still doesn't amount to a hill thing because <laughs> it's just bluegrass music. That's it's just it's a simple thing. It's no use making it complicated. <laughs> you know. Who knows? Well, I, but I'm like you, Tom. Why didn't they sit down and say, oh, you remember that tune? Oh, uh, yeah, yes, sir. Uh, you showed me that tune. Could you feature Bill Monroe saying that? I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> no. Because no. everything was Bill Monroe. He did it all. And he took all the credit. And same with Earl Scruggs. I knew both of them. Earl didn't take credit, but he didn't, he didn't push it away either. Well, I think Bill yeah. really... I think he really got to believe in his version of, of what happened. I mean, I, I remember one time somebody mentioned doing Foggy Mountain Top, and he said, and that's one of my numbers. He did? Yeah. And, you know, Carter family, 1928, 29. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was four. He could have written that. <laughs> he was 11. <laughs> uh, you, you take our buddy Butch Robbins. Now, everybody loves Butch, but Butch, Butch has this thing in his mind where Bill Monroe's here and Earl Scruggs is here and they're fighting at all times. <laughs> and I don't, I'm not going to live like that. You know, I don't care. I listen to the music. I don't care what they did personally or how many songs they wrote. But, but you can sure get into that if you can want I, to. Can I tell a Butch Robbins story? Tell one. Is it going to get me in trouble? <laughs> did I open up a kettle of fish? Well, I was actually at Earl and Louise's house when somebody had sent Louise a copy of Butch's book, and they had a bookmark on the page where Butch talks about Earl. And anybody, I'm sure maybe one or two people here might have heard of this book anyway. <laughs> Butch wrote this tell-all where he basically blasted a lot of people, but uh, he wrote some pretty scathing stuff about Earl Scruggs. And I was had the pleasure of being over there at their house there in uh, Madison, the brick house, and one day. Uh, and she had just gotten that book and had opened it up and read it. And she said, uh, she told Earl she wanted to read him something. So we're sitting there, you know, having a cup of tea, and she reads that whole page about how, you know, string beans started bluegrass, Rudy Lyle was past the banjo player, Earl Scruggs was, <laughs> went on and on like that. And she gets to the to the end of that, and she turns to Earl and she says, uh, "That's what Butch Robbins wrote about you." And Earl said, 
Who's Butch Robbins? <laughs> Touche. <laughs> that's, that's no sin. <laughs> Period. <laughs> true story. Anyway. True. Well, Charlie, you got another banjo that I, I guess you are briefly acquainted with this. One. I think I played this last year, didn't I? Didn't we, we do, or the year before? Year before last. Yeah, you know a lot more about it uh, than I do. Tony, tell, tell, them, tell them where this banjo's been. Well, it's, it was in this gentleman's basement when I first saw it. And uh, in that case? <laughs> in, no, just the pot. No, it oh, wasn't. Just this, just this right here? Yeah, just the pot. Now, not the resonator. That is uh, actually an RB1, a pre-war RB1 resonator that 